Morning, everyone. Super excited to be here today. I, uh, why don't you guys, uh, some of you, allow your cameras? I'd love to see your your faces and expression. Um, you know, throughout this process, one of the incredible things that uh, Zoom provides to us is that that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, I hope everybody's doing well, surviving uh, this storm. Uh, I've talked to several of you that have uh, told me that uh, they feel productivity is increasing. They feel kind of a, a revert to the market, which is very exciting for us to hear as a company. Um, for I see a lot of our agents here. Hello to all the Avanti Way people. I see a lot of people from the outside too. We are live on Facebook as well. So hello to everyone out there. I'm super excited to be sharing to you uh, the data-driven hack view of the market. Um, you guys put me to work very hard on this series <laughs> to come up with a lot of unique things and structures and, and ways to present things. So uh, very exciting to, to share that with you guys. And for all of you that are not from Auntie Way, we're, we're still in the realster strong hashtag pushing information down to our industry, to every facet of it, giving you great knowledge to really upgrade our industry as a whole, not just Avanti Way, but everybody out there. So uh, kudos for you joining us and, and seeing this effort and enjoying it. Uh, I promise today's, uh, today's presentation is going to be very, very kick-ass at the least. Okay, guys? So nonetheless, let's get started. Um, we have a, a big crowd coming up now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay? And nonetheless, Talking about hacking data, um, I've been doing a lot of research and, and obviously uh, many aspects of the data, the effect of COVID, uh, comparing to 2018, comparing to now. And I decided to, to kind of tackle this down in, in four strategies very clearly. One, the national overview. This is the type of news you're probably hearing in CNN and Fox News, and it's driving a lot of the things that are happening and the news that's out there. Now, as professionals, we focus on the micro aspect of that data. So we need to learn to take macro and bring it down to micro, and that is the hack. You will learn today, guaranteed, no matter what, taking the national data down into the AVIC system and just pulling out incredible information over to your consumers to give them confidence on what's going out there. I'm gonna give you the outlook based on Goldman Sachs, on Merrill Lynch, on Avanti Way, and what I personally think, obviously, as Avanti Way, on what the outlook is in the market, right? Again, learning how to hack macro into your market. And then last but not least, and I think this is the biggest part, and I know that sometimes our webinars get a little bit longer than usual. We're just very passionate and we love sharing information. But nonetheless, I'm going to teach you how to take advantage of that data. Take advantage of that data to do the most important thing, create your story. Stop letting the news create your stories. I need you guys to get out there, grab this information and develop your story. The stories don't always have to be good. You don't always have to be selling. You don't always have to be doing all these things. You could just be simply sharing the facts to the market and I'm going to teach you how to express that so you begin to be in control of the newsroom in your side. With today's media, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, Zooms, everybody getting out there, it's so easy to become the news forecaster. And we have to take that to our advantage because we are the realtors of our community and we need to make people understand the impact of real estate and the impact that all this has. So nonetheless, Let's get going. There's going to be a couple polls coming up that I want you to interact with, okay? Bring out your notepads, your iPads, get everything you need to start really taking some amazing notes here. So nonetheless, national overview. Seller traffic index provided by the National Association of Realtors, okay? Basically says a how strong some of the markets are in terms of seller traffic. And we see Florida is at a very stable side of it right on on that side florida is doing pretty well means we're not strong we're not weak on seller traffic um, a lot of other states obviously have come down to being weak in their traffic of seller traffic 
And uh, other markets like Wyoming and Alaska have actually become strong, which is pretty surprising to me. But I guess those are two areas least affected by COVID-19, no? Um, let's take a look here at home property appreciation, right? Over time and bringing a little bit of a picture of where we're at now in real estate versus where we were at in 2008. And I'm gonna compare a lot because all your consumers and all of us still have the injury from 2008. Would we agree? Thumbs up on that? 2008 has a lot of our injuries, right? So the human mind is always going to re revert back to what is it that I, I can remember that happened, right? And it's very important as professionals, uh, taking the narrative of the story, we have the info to be able to compare these two things. So in 2000 to 2005, we had huge compounded appreciation. This is appreciation year by year. It was massive from 2014 to 2009. Look at the appreciation that we've had in general nationwide. Four, five, six percent was the peak. It's back at four. Here we were having appreciations of eight, nine, ten percent. Obviously, that issue of appreciation caused what? For us to start pulling money out of our houses, for us to buy more houses, for us to think the real estate game is the way we're going to live our lives. And we started using our house money to front our lifestyle which is a very, very, very bad idea on that side. So two very different markets, house inventory back in 2007. And again, this is nationally, we will be coming into the Miami segment here and then touching up on some micro markets. We had 8.2 months of inventory nationwide in 2007. Today, we have three months of inventory. Three months, guys, that is, that is nothing. Right, that is a seller's market, meaning that there is not enough supply to take over the inventory that's out there, the demand. So we were coming up with a very strong pipeline of demand. I will be touching up on unemployment. I will be answering those questions for you guys. So you guys put that picture together. Now, here I have in front of you a graph from, it's the Mortgage Credit Availability Index, okay? This is a national index that shows us, all right, that shows us how easy is it to get a mortgage. And we see back in 2006 to 2008, we were at 900. Basically, the higher the index, the easier the money, the, the, the easier it is to get a loan. Today, we stand with a market of, of 181. Do you guys see that big difference? It is huge, guys. It is huge where you see that difference that it's been much more difficult to get a loan. And guys, give me thumbs up for you with the cameras. Are we agreeing on this? Are we seeing that it's much more difficult to get a loan? It is, right? So that, that being said, it's very interesting because it puts the market at a level where if it hasn't been easy to give loans, does it mean that, that people are going to throw away their house because it took them, it was harder for them to get a loan. And the answer to that is absolutely not. You know, if I, if I got a loan and I have good credit and I have good things that are working out for me, I'm not just going to throw away my, my, my asset and the opportunity to hold. In 2006, they were giving everybody a loan. You had a heartbeat, you had, you were alive, you can breathe, you got a loan. This is no longer happening, which is a great indicator for the real estate market at the macro level nationally, right? Now, bringing that down, what's the invert of this? Well, back in 2006 and seven, which we've talked about several times, we had subprime loans. Subprime loans are any loan, any loan that is not given by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. They're basically portfolio loans, right? And these loans can be up for the high-end market. They can be structured for the low-end market with low down payment. 101% um, financing or 100% financing ninja, which is no income, no assets, et cetera, et cetera. You could see that this basically has dropped down to a 3% as opposed to back then in 2007, peaking at 73%, guys. So obviously everybody's getting money because there was unique loans in the market uh, to provide this. Now there's been none and there's not been none right now. There hasn't been since 2009. Right? Again, trajectory that the market is very, 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 very different from the 2008 crash. Now, 
Here's another graph. How much cash percentage are transactions? And you're seeing that in 2005, we reached the minimum part of the market. 10% of the deals were cash. 90% were finance, guys. So imagine everybody's getting a loan to buy a house. Everybody's just, you know, financing as much as they can. The market goes down or the property value doesn't equate for me holding my house. What do I do? Throw it out. And that is the fear today, guys. That is the one fear. Is everybody gonna start throwing away their houses? Is unemployment not gonna allow people to pay their houses and they're gonna have to throw them out into the market? And those are the types of questions we're gonna be answering for you today as we're going through this so you put things together. Today, there's 33% cash. In my historical knowledge of this index that I've been carrying for many years. And if we go further back, a normal market works between 15 and 25% cash. Okay. That is a balanced market with about 80 or so financing, right? That the counterpart. Now we're still not a balanced market. We still have a lot of people putting cash into the real estate market, which is a great sign that people won't just dump their properties. Okay. So that being said, all these equations I just gave you equate to one important factor here. This next slide, equity, right? People do not throw out their money. Would we agree to that? Thumbs up on that? People do not throw out their money. In 2008, the equity position in houses was negative to three to 4% maximum, negative to three to 4%. Hear that out, guys. Today, 53.8% equity, okay? 53. sorry, have at least 50% equity in their house. So if I bought a house 200,000 three years ago, I basically have a house that's worth 400,000 and I have sitting in there $200,000 in equity, okay? The average, the average equity in a home in the United States based on CoreLogic. CoreLogic is the biggest data provider of MLS information and state information. In fact, CoreLogic is our MLS here in, 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 in Miami. They say the average is at $177,000, guys. So let's play with this number to give you guys a perspective. If the market crashed 50%, okay, that would put our equity position to what? 75,000, 76,000, 80 something thousand, 85, sorry, thousand. Would you walk away from $85,000? No, you would not. And that's saying we take a 50% drop, 50% drop in the market. The national average says 37% of homes are owned free and clear, guys. So, we are sitting in a very different market in real estate that draws a very different picture from 2008. And obviously the pandemic draws a very different picture in many aspects, right? So this is a very interesting graph and very interesting information that you guys can use as being the narrators of your stories. Okay. Now breaking that down, let's put that into effect, right? Back then in 2005, six and seven, there was $824 billion, billion dollars taken out of houses refinancing and taking equity out, right? I would refinance, I would get my, 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 uh, my money out of my house and what would I do? Start paying my car, pay my credit cards off and again, support my lifestyle. Not a good sign. Real estate is not made your, your personal homes are not made to just take care of your expenditure. They're usually used as an investment to create wealth over time. Now, the now, this is the picture, 2017, 71 billion, 2018, 87 billion, 2019, 74 billion. That's 232 billion taken out in refinance loans. Do you see the contrast from one market to the other? The other market's almost four times the amount of people took out money from their house, got into debt up to their ears, right? And then couldn't pay that back and said, hey, why am I going to pay a house when, when it's not worth it? I'm going to drop it. Very, very, very different position on the equity side today. 
So now let's get to the biggest topic here, because this is what I hear in the street, unemployment. No, no, well, look, unemployment, we, we just don't know, it's going crazy. Unemployment, if nobody's paying their mortgage, then everybody's gonna start dropping their houses, and if everybody stops dropping their houses, prices will start coming down. Uh, it's, a, it's a reasonable train of thought. Now let's look at real national data, okay? In front of you, you have the unemployment sector, okay? Let me zoom into this. The unemployment sector by job types, right? So the hardest hit out of all the unemployment, 8.3%, and I only did the top uh, several of them, I didn't go through the whole list because the rest were kind of minute, is actually the agriculture and private sector wage and salary workers, right? Uh, within that, right, that breaks down agriculture and you might ask yourself, why? If we're going to the supermarket and we're buying food like crazy. Well, I, I Reading this, I found out that there's really two types of agriculture. There's mainstream agriculture that sells to consumers, which has a completely different line of distribution, guys. That is from grabbing the stuff in the farm, sending it to a production plant that packages it up in small packages and then turns it into the supermarkets. Then you have the actual restaurant and, and, and hospitality side of it, where it's packaged up in big, huge containers. Two different distribution lines. And I didn't really know this till right now that I started reading and I was curious to say, hey, well, why is this happening? And what I came to realize is obviously when you grab the cruise industry, you grab the travel industry, how many of us eat in a cruise? Thousands of people eat in cruises, right? The airline industry, the restaurants have completely slowed down. And when you start grabbing all of this, guys, the impact there has been very big. The next one is leisure and hospitality. Hotels, obviously, you know, very bad situation there. Casinos, very bad situation there. Um, you know, stadiums, sports games, movie theaters, all that has been obviously hit very, very, very hard. Construction has also gotten hit hard. Mining has gotten hit hard. Now, Historically, in my opinion, in the last probably 10 years or decade, mining has been diminishing already anyhow. So to me, that's not a real factor of an impact of uh, COVID-19. If you look historically, mining has been coming down. The president of the United States has attempted to revive that industry and has done many things to get that back. Transportation and utility down 5%. Uh, wholesale retail trades down 4.9% on unemployment and professional and business services down. So there, there's two outlooks that I, that I give you here, right, in this scenario, okay? Um, unemployment right now has two options. It either starts improving slowly as we reopen, which will be the, the tendency, right? Because, okay, a lot of hotels like Hilton uh, forload a lot of their employees. Now they're going to open back up. Are they going to operate at 100% capacity? Obviously not, right? We obviously know they're probably going to operate at 10, 20, 30 uh, percent uh, uh, operations, right? They're not going to let their investments fall. So what does that mean is that more people will come back into the job workforce, right? We just don't know how many will come back based on what we're seeing. And when you take a picture like that, you start understanding something. You start saying, well, it, it, can things get even worse than this? And the answer to that is probably not because of the fact as we start kind of re-engaging, we're going to reopen. Is it possible for the virus to jump back and cause us to, to completely close? My take and my personal view and what I see from professionals out there, and, and there's two sides of the coin. People are saying, no, it's going to bounce back and completely close the country. And the other side says, no, it's going to bounce back. If it bounces back, it's going to be in segmentations in certain areas, right? The areas that are not using the safety protocols and whatnot will get hard, hit harder. So I do feel that we're going to have closure of certain pockets in the United States that will have to close down completely. Can Miami be one of them? Absolutely it can. We don't listen to the rules here. You see the pictures of South Point Park, everybody without a mask, people speaking with each other without a mask. It's just crazy if we don't listen to the rules we ourselves are going to dig ourselves back into getting stuck here. Now, if we use all the measures necessary to protect ourselves and whatnot, you would avoid getting back into that pocket. So that being said, we 
in my opinion, have bottomed out on the unemployment side based on the information we have until now. Is it possible to go back down? Anything's possible. Is it probable? I think the country is going to work around these pockets and keep the economy, you know, kind of going. And if we use safety and all that, I feel we'll get out of this in that side and say we'll start a slower recovery towards the economy. Now let's take a, take a look at what Goldman Sachs unemployment rate projections came out to be, right? They're saying 2020 will end the year with 15% unemployment, huge number, bigger than 2008 guys, huge. But 15% of unemployment means 85% of us are still working. 85% of us are still making money. 85% of us are still consuming. 85% of us are still, are still buying, selling real estate. It's going to move. From the next year, it'll drop down to six, six and eight and a half percent. Now, in one year, we'll drop down to the level that we were less than in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay? So, very important stats to look out to. And then they're saying five and four percent. This is not me telling you this, this is Goldman Sachs, right? We know Goldman Sachs is a huge, huge finance a consulting firm, an investment firm. They have great data. This is what the big guys are saying on how the market will project uh, to move forward. This is big guys, because this means the recovery can be at a lot, lot quicker pace. And we'll talk about different recoveries soon. Now, moving on uh, through, let's take a look at unemployment since the great depression, the great recession and the current crisis guys. Great recession, 1930, 8.7, 1931, 15, 1932, 23%, 1933, 24%. That was the peak, 24%. One in every four people you knew did not have a job, was starving. Very, very bad situation. 1934, 21, 1935, 20, and then it, it, it kind of uh, dissipated and obviously started going down. This was a, a very long, treacherous recovery to get out of this. Great Recession, 2008, we had 7.3, 2009, 7.9, 2010, 9.3, 2011, 8.5, 2012, 7.9, 2013, 6.7, okay? Now, in 2016, 13, it was a great, it was a great time in terms of the economy coming back up and us having a very positive outlook. So if you tell me that in 2020, it's going to be very ugly. Okay. Coming up to the third quarter, it's going to start reactivating. Okay. 2021, six to 8% will be unemployed. We're, we're at the 2013 level guys in 2022, according to Goldman Sachs, we're at 5%, which is less than 2008 all the way to 2013. So this is not a long-term recovery. Now consider this, you might ask yourself, well, I still think that, you know, this unemployment is going to cause people to not pay their house. Well, my answer to that is if people have $177,000 in equity in their house, do you not think that there's a way they're going to be able to tap into that and be able to pay six months of not having a job a year? Uh, our government has helped, up, helped us with $2.1 trillion, guys. They're not going to let people sink just like that, right? We've learned our lessons in how to not react in the Great Recessions and the Great Depressions. The Great Recessions taught us a lot in how to react. The government reacted extremely fast here. There are solutions into the table that will drive the catastrophe to be much, much less. And we have an incredible nation that reacts in incredibly agile and fast to try to mitigate the situation uh, that we can. So that's my take on unemployment. Ask questions, guys. Please feel free. Fill them up. As we go along, I'll be answering some of them and getting that information kind of flowing through you. So I'll, I'll take an unemployment. Yes, a big factor to always consider, but look and land numbers. Quote Goldman Sachs as you speak to people. This is the type of data that you and the story you need to portray to your consumers to be able to guide and give information. Let the consumer, based on the information you've given them, decide whether it's time to buy or not. It's, it's not it's, I'm not trying to sit here and convince you of a good story. 
I'm trying to tell you real stats, real data, and what the other people and players are saying. I do give you my personal opinion as I go along, but you guys, by presenting this data, will obviously have the individuals draw their concept of what they need to do in their particular side. Now, that being said, let's get down to Miami-Dade County, right? So we went from macro na national, we're now going to the Miami-Dade County area. 2003, 24,000 sales peaked up and then the market completely dropped to 12,000 sales a year in 2008. It was the worst, worst time of the market. Uh, in 2013, 2013 yeah, 13 to 14, we hit 33,000 sales in the market. We outpaced the peak of 2005. We outpaced that peak. And then we slowly started coming down. And what you started seeing is a flattened market, right? We've been between 26, 29,000, 30,000. That's where we've maintained our pace in terms of markets and movements there. Now, months of inventory, okay? We saw that the nation has three months of inventory. Now, Miami-Dade County, Here's the months of inventories. In 2003, 5.77 months of inventory. In 2008, 39 months of inventory. In 2013, four months of inventory. And now we sit with 2019, right? That's where we're at. We're at seven months of inventory ending the year of 2019. We were roughly seeing a great start to the year and that number was gonna be sliding down and, 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 and it, it, there was good effort for that number or good indicators that that number was gonna come down. The effect of months of inventory, I think it's very difficult to see right now. We still have to wait another month or so to see the lag and see, be able to decipher numbers, but I've seen a lot more activity the last two weeks, a lot. I'm telling you, this went from zero to 100 in the last two weeks. I'm seeing a lot more contracts being done, uh, a lot more movement being done on that side of the market. So those are great indicators. So here's a price change over time, right? 2003, we, we were at 15.26% increase. We went all the way up to 68% increase in the peak. And then we dropped 31%, the biggest depreciation drop of real estate in its history, guys, was in 2010, after the 2008 recession. Remember, this was caused by the real estate market. This, is, this current pandemic has nothing to do with the real estate market. It has to do with the health side of it, right? And that's a very big different uh, you know, uh, situation. And we've come all the way up to 65% increase, okay, on the market on that side, okay? Now, that being said, let's go down and we see now another very important graph the cost to own versus to rent. Over every year since I've gotten into this business, I always do these averages. This is a key indicator to me on how markets move. When I got into this business, I was always told, oh no, you know, the markets move based on supply and demand, which is very true, right? But there's a driven factor that's behind that, that not many people understand and know. Because as you look at, big data and you're constantly studying it, you're, you see these patterns that I'm about to teach you. And what I was always told is, listen, you have an emotional part. Everybody starts buying and then you, you have the snowball effect and then the market moves. Then everybody stops buying and then the snowball effect of everybody stops buying goes bigger, 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 and it stops and there's a lot of emotions in Dubai. Our natural instinct would say, well, that, that makes sense, but we can't ever prove that. And I figured out over time, the biggest, the biggest, indicator is rent, the cost of renting versus owning. That is a big driver on demand, right? We don't, can't drive supply because we need to build supply. So Lennar builds supplies. Other people will build supply. Other developers will build supply. Demand is driven by the logic that if it is cheaper to own than it is to rent, do I buy? Can I get thumbs up on that? I would buy, right? It's cheaper to own than it is to to rent it doesn't make any logical sense for us not to not to purchase okay now that being said uh, that being said in 2010 it was 30 35 percent less to own than it was to rent 
Now you would ask yourself, well, Enrique, why didn't everybody go out in the street and buy? It's because we go back to the charts of, of the index, the, afford, uh, the mortgage uh, index that I showed you, how easy it was to get loans. That's completely dropped. It's very difficult to get a loan. So we've seen very small differences in this rent versus own price over time. Right now, we're pretty much at a balanced market in overall. Now, not every zip code is like this. If you look at Brickell, it's more expensive to own than it is to rent. If you look at Kibis Kane, more expensive than it is uh, uh, to own to rent. If you look at up in Aventoria area, there's pockets. And this is the idea. You need to bring the national story down to your market, which is what we're going to get into. But that being said, imagine right now you are my tenant. You are paying $2,000 a month. I knock on your door as a home homeowner and say, hey, how's it going? Here are the keys to the apartment. It is yours. You're just going to sign this paper and you're going to pay me the same $2,000, but you are the owner. How many renters do you think would say no to that? Not many, right? And this is what's going on right now, guys. It costs you the same basically to own than it is to rent. That is a very good indicator, a very good piece of information for you guys to understand. Now mix this data point with historically, historically in every recession, depression, and market turnaround, rental prices increase. In fact, rental prices, okay, rental prices increased in 2009 till now over 100%. They increased over 100%. So if a recession hits us right now, it's only gonna cost much more to rent and it's only gonna be much cheaper to own a property. And these are the facts, this is the information you have to land and I'm gonna show you how to use the tools in Avanti way to get to that micro side of the data with a click of a button and no digging into the amount of data that you need to put together. Now guys, let's take a look at this. I'm putting up a poll right now, okay? And I'm gonna explain this side to you. We're launching a poll. Okay, now the outlook, right? There are three types of scenarios that usually we use in looking when the economy downturns. Are we going to get out of this in a V shape? What does a V shape mean? The economy comes down and quickly comes back up. Are we going to get into this in a U shape? The economy comes down, right? And then stays down for a little bit and then comes back. Or is this gonna be an L shape? An L shape is it comes down and it stays down very long. Now the difference in kind of putting a picture mentality for you to understand this, V shape is like grabbing a tennis ball that I put there to you, a good brand new tennis ball, taking it out, bouncing it on the floor, you know that that bounces very quickly back up. Would we agree? Now a U shape one will be an older tennis ball that we throw right? And it bounces and, it, and it's, it doesn't have the amount of air. So it kind of, boom, and then it comes back up, right? And an L shape is a very old ball, very old ball that you just throw and it goes, boom, and it stays on the floor, right? 2008 recovery was an L shape recovery. That was the name that they do this. And now this is common street names, some, some stuff that you use because th th these analogies that I'm giving you are, are analogies that, that are used by newscasters to try to get to the consumer to understand what's going on. Now, based on those three recoveries, I want you to put what you think the recovery is and the outlook is. So please answer the polls as you see there and, and push them through so that we can get great information. All of you, please, in the room, answer as much as, much as you can. We're almost uh, about 100 people in the room Unfortunately for the people on Facebook Live and Instagram Live, uh, they can't pull in, but nonetheless, we're getting a lot of people in the room to get a good idea. So uh, I've been hearing in the news now a couple new terms, the W recovery, which would mean it's two Vs together. We're going to come back up and then the coronavirus is going to come back and hunt us and it's going to come back down and then back up. Uh, you know, this is a new term. This is not a common one, but that's what they're saying. Now, on the other side, I've also heard of the Nike, uh, the Nike uh, recovery, the Nike sign recovery. And I, and I saw it and I saw it in the news. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting of how they put it. And it's, you know, a slower recovery and it's that check, check box, right? There's a lot of them that go on there, but basically these are the three that normally happen. I think the polling's back. Uh, 
We got a good amount of people in that poll and basically V-shaped recovery, 32% of you think it's going to be a V-shaped recovery. 68% of you think it's going to be a U-shaped recovery. None of you, none of you think it's going to be an L-shaped recovery. None of you. Now that's a, that's a great sign because remember our emotions, our logic of thinking drives the economy that we live in. And the fact that we all have this visualization that there is a recovery, things will come back to numb, uh, to, to recovery, it's going to get us to push very easily, right? So that, that notion is very, very important and good for you guys to have. Now, let's see what the big guys say, right? Um, here's, a, here's, a, here's an actual, an actual uh, before we get to the big guys, sorry. Here's an actual slide, okay, where uh, 45 economists, we're given a same, more or less same poll I just gave you, except with the W shape. And this is what they all coincided in, 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 in saying the economy would react. These are all based out of Europe and, and the US, high individuals, high economics, uh, economists, sorry, that were given the same poll. 22 thought that it would be U shape, 10 thought that it would be V shape, seven thought it would check, it, would, it was a check mark shape, the, the Nike swoosh. Five thought it would be a, a, a W shape, and then one was unknown, okay? This is the total amount of the 45 economists that said that, right? Now, that being said, let's take a look at what these new guys say here. I don't know, the cheers thing came out in the last second on my screen here, but look what they say. The outlook is in the Great Recession, okay, which is this one here, which was 2008, it took us nine years to get out of the problem. It was an L shape. Do you guys kind of see the L? It dropped and then it just stayed stagnant. Coming up, it almost looks like a, like a check mark, but it was more of an L recovery. In the Great Depression, look at the drop. Came down here, came back up, but it took 12 years to get out of this. Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, okay? JP Morgan, Chase Bank, Goldman Sachs, huge investment firms, big banks. Look at what they're saying the recovery is going to look like. V-shaped recovery, okay? So again, economics, there's a lot of people disagreeing and agreeing. And again, whatever you find to be the right source. For example, I have a lot of clients that invest with Goldman Sachs. So when you bring up numbers of Goldman Sachs, they feel connected with that and that means something to them. Maybe in this chart, other people will think it's a U-shaped recovery. What I do know, what I do know, and I can tell you in my personal opinion is that it's going to maybe be a hybrid, but I have more of a feel that it's going to be a V shape because of the simple fact, because of the simple fact, things were rolling so hard. This was not a recession caused by financial markets, by real estate markets, by an industry. It was caused by a health issue. All that put aside, all these industries are in pretty healthy conditions to obviously move forward and navigate. And if we look at the unemployment numbers, I, I would personally say, in my opinion, we've obviously bottomed out. It, it's going to get a little bit better and can it get worse after that? Yes, it all depends on the outlook. But I think we bottomed out and we are willing to roar back into the economy. And obviously being an election year is only going to cause the president to, to infuse more, more help, more lifelines for businesses to get out there and move forward. Okay, so those are the outlooks in terms of that. Um, I would love somebody right now before we get started into the micro data that's willing to come up and, and speak and give, um, give us their perception or they can share their perception on their side. Um, can I have a, a raise of hands of somebody that wants to come up? And don't be scared, I'm not gonna kill you. It's gonna be very interesting and some of the outlooks that we can share out there. Do we have anybody? You could, uh, you could raise your hand. Oh, you guys are all scared out there, huh? <laughs> we got one. Okay, give me a second here. Let's go ahead and unmute. Andreina. Hola. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Thank you for raising your hand and sharing your, your outlook in this. I'd love to hear it and, uh, and, and share and kind of shape it for you as well. 
So tell us, what it, is your outlook? For me? Yeah, what do I you, think it's going to be? I think it's going to be a beach. Okay. And why do you feel that way? Uh, well, I have had a lot of movement. I think that when something happens, people, I don't know, like, can I say in English or better in, or, or everybody speaks Spanish? Uh, however you wish, uh, English or Spanish, I'll, I'll translate for you. Oh, okay, I can, uh, I can tell you in English. So I think when something bad happens, uh, la gente se adecua, o sea, obviamente llega al fondo y se adecua para, 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 digamos, para, eh, digamos, adecuarse a la situación, ¿no? Y yo veo mucha gente, like, eh, moving other ways. For example, in, in my case, for real estate, I have been having more showings than ever. And there is people from Italy coming here. The, the, the market changed for for example in Brickle Place I have a list in, and and Italy was never there so now 14 percent of the market in that building is from Italy and obviously 67 from United States looking for more space for view you know they said that here you can go to the ocean and and breathe so I think everything has a uh, you know uh, como que Cosas malas pueden hacer que hayan cambios positivos, la gente genera, etcétera, etcétera. Entonces, no sé, that's my, like... Good. Yeah, so, so very interesting you say that because I'll give you some perspectives that I was reading on too and looking at the data. Uh, th th this, this pandemic, eh, Andrina, is going to cause a very, very, very unique situation because you're going to now have people thinking, okay, and me buying a home in the outskirts of where I live in case something like this comes back up, I can leave the city, take my family and have a, a you know, a place. And, and obviously New York, they have the Hamptons, but they love Florida. They love, you know, Miami, the outskirts, the Gables, the, the more suburb areas. And we're seeing a big influx on people coming in, you know? And, and also, for example, what I'm seeing is that a lot of people is helping each other with rent payment. For example, there is a very famous dry cleaners in Brickle in 7th Street. And I know that the owner of the land, which own not only the dry cleaners uh, uh, land, also the, 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 there is a small school there and other projects, there, he's lowering the rent to 50%. So what I'm seeing is that uh, because it's not only real estate, it's global, people is helping each other. So I think we can recover if, you know, if everybody puts a little bit, you know, un granito de arena, it recovers, you know, faster. Much, much faster, no. So, so very, very, very good points on your side. Uh, I, I agree. I, I see a V-shaped v recovery for Avanti Way. Uh, the, the, the first part of the storm was, was, was scary, was very slow. Things were not moving. And then kind of in this whole second half, I'm just seeing, you know, the engines kind of fire back up and things begin to move. So I do agree. I think people kind of settled. This is going to be the new normal. We got to keep moving forward. How are we going to move forward? And that's what we're seeing out in the street. I totally agree with that. Bueno, I'm glad to see you're moving and doing great. And thank you so much for sharing, huh? Bye-bye. See you. Go ahead. Sorry. So. I know. Hello to everybody, and hope you are everybody's fine. Bye bye. Okay, we have Gianfranco here, uh, willing to share. Let me put him on live here. Gianfranco, you are on with us, right? Gianfranco, oh, I think he might have lost his internet. Yeah, no, I. Oh, there you are. Yeah, there you are. I muted myself. Okay, yeah. What I'm seeing is, uh, for me, it's clear that it's going to be the V shape. Uh, people are going from one extreme to the other. At the beginning, we felt like people were a little bit scared, but right now, everyone's getting used to the new normal, but maybe here in Florida, we're seeing that people go from one extreme to the other. So so right now, it's uh, at least from my case, I'm seeing uh, a flow coming from, from everywhere. People that they wanted to buy, right now they have clear, they left their transactions at the beginning because they were scared. And right now they're very sure that they're going to do the transactions and they know that they have less competition. So that this is a driver for, for buyers because they know that if, if they don't have competition, this is a good time to, to get good value for their, the properties they're getting. And considering even investors, it's really interesting because some people have 
got scared others they're like very very firm that they want something because they know once the market gets back into a normal market there that's the point where they know that they, they will get higher gains so so it is uh, a very interesting time and and a lot of people once they understand or they go through their their own process of of fear and and right now honestly if they compare the us with other countries they're like no way right there the government is putting money in order for the economy to to keep up and in other countries people they're struggling and they're seeing how complicated it is so at the end we're on the best position even being looked from the outside that's a good point and one of the of the things that that i've seen also that it is a good opportunity for people that want a need to visa that are coming from abroad and that there's a lot of niches that that we can like squeeze yeah. Yeah. yeah look I, i think you know it's interesting to see i don't know if anybody else wants to come up and share uh, i'd love to hear one more story to get kind of the vision um here you have showtime assist uh, Gianfranco as well for for Andreina that you you're feeling the comeback this is the amount of showings in Florida you're seeing a v-shaped return look at this right here so there's evidence already on the amount of activity in the market showings of properties and all that that it is coming in that v-shape you guys are also feeling out there now guys i, I want to put a perspective for you at Avanti Way and our agents we've been pretty active you know I've I've had the experience right now to talk to several agents from outside of the company that think this is this is still Armageddon. They're still at home. They're not moving. They're scared of getting out. They don't know. Uh, they feel every everybody's just shutting them down. And and that's where this next part of of what I'm going to teach you is getting that micro data using all this type of national data down to the micro side and most importantly being the narrator of the story that's out there happening. This is the key to success. And a lot of the agents here at Avanti Way, specifically, you see them using that and they're driving the story. They're grabbing a lot of the marketing materials that we're giving. And I'm seeing stories all across, all across the internet, Facebook, uh, Why to Buy. I see Gianfranco, who is just up on, on, on with me here, um, doing investor webinars all across you know, Central and South America, which kudos to that, uh, Gianfranco, because, you know, you're, you're putting the story out there. And, and these are the type of agents that are leading the way. And everyone out there, whether you work with us or not, we all need to learn to survive now. If you are not looking how to survive right now, you are going to be way behind when this thing comes back to the new normal. So get ahead of the game, look at the national data and start implementing this locally. Now for the Avanti Way agents, which we have access to the tools you guys are about to see, these are great groundbreaking technology data driven tools that make our data driven agents possible. And I love to share this with the public because I do see investors with us here. I do see a uh, realtors from other, other you know, parts of the United States. And we really love showcasing our drive to make every, our agents very, very data driven, which is a new requirement in not only today's market, but in the last 10 to 15 years, data driven agents have been very relevant out there. So nonetheless, let's now break it down. Oh, I had one more person, sorry, which I love the story. Uh, before we break it down into moving on, we have Guillermo. Guillermo, how's it going? Hello? Did we lose him? Guillermo? Uh, hello? Yeah, I think we lost him. Okay, so we'll keep going. Breaking down the data. This is very exciting. I'm very passionate about this tool because it's one of the babies we put together here in the company and I, I was a leader on, uh, you know, deploying this. And Uh, we're going to break it down and how to use it with the COVID-19 and all the information you need. So we got macro data, right? We talked about days on market. We talked about, uh, you know, uh, inventory, demand. Uh, we talked about several different aspects that are very, very important that we can now break down into our micro data segment. And I'm going to teach you all the tips and te techniques to do that. So number one, 
to succeed in making a story, just like a news reporter uh, exists uh, on their side, you, you essentially have an area that you're covering, right? The, the local WSBN 7 News is not covering all the national news. They're really bringing news from a local market. In order for you to be the storyteller, because this is what you're going to come out of here learning. How am I the narrator of the story? How am I giving information of my market? And what are the conditions? We're not trying to skew information to look at only the positive side to buy. We're trying to give real information that could be useful for an investor because maybe it's not the best time for a homeowner to buy. Uh, you know, and this is very, the decision of the information that people receive is, it all depends on their shoes, right? If I'm an investor and the market goes sour, it's a good time to buy. If I'm a homeowner, maybe my rent is gonna increase and it's a good time for, for me to buy. Let the beholder of the information decide on how to react to the information you're gonna give. So we're gonna, we're gonna do two contrasts of market, guys, because I can't do them all, okay? So we'll do two contrasts completely different. And I'm gonna pick Brickle and I'm gonna pick West Kendall, okay? I'm gonna pick two different markets. Uh, one is more on the higher end, the other one's more on the mid end. So you guys kind of see the differences. So I'm gonna quickly click here on this neighborhood and I'm gonna do a search here, okay? This is now going to bring me every single piece of information, amount of households, demographics of the area, how many have sold in the last 12 months, what is the demand, what is the discount, what is seller contributions, how do two bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms sell? It's gonna give me every piece of breakdown, guys, we can imagine. So we start off with now, we went through national, we got through Miami, right? Now we're getting into that micro market, which is, going to be information valuable for 30,000 households, guys. You see the number right here? That's how many households you have in that area. So now you are the storyteller of the pandemic and leading for 30,000 people that live in this area. You could obviously make a custom area for those of you who use the tool. You can do, um, you can look at it by school zone, uh, cities. You have many ways to shave the cat. And here it starts telling me, this is a seller's market. There's 30,000 households. Closed versus active. There's 946 that closed. There's only 326 properties available. The discount in the market there, how's that going? The average price that, that uh, people are asking for properties, the average price people close on property, the days on market, the average days that it takes to close, the average asking price per square foot and close. Now, to me, that's beautiful data. That is macro, macro data of that particular market. But now let's break that data down a little bit more now. So if I click more details, okay, I am now being able to see again the demands for each bedroom, right? Over time in this market. Now, most importantly, I am seeing absorption rates come up over time. So here it's looking at all my sales over time, all my active properties and absorption rates in the market, okay? We are coming up with something very special for you guys with a button of COVID-19, okay? Where you're gonna be able to see weekly demands and fluctuations of markets to really break down and bring the storyline to your clients. But in each one of these segments of bedrooms, you can look at the data with days on market, size, months of inventory. You see every storyline that is out there. Now, how do you grab this data here and bring it into a storyline to your market? Do a segment on, on effective bedrooms COVID-19 and just go down through these lists saying what is going on, which are the markets that have more demands. For example, in this area, if you own maybe a, a five plus bedroom home, the market's gonna affect you more because the inventory is not in so much demand. And you clearly see it here in the graphs and you clearly see it here with the closed, with the, um, with the units closed, sorry, up here, the units closed versus the units active. If we see a price range here, so let's look at the same data price range. We're seeing 100,000 to 200 to, yeah, 200,000 high demand, 200 to 300,000 high demand, 300 to 400,000 high demand, lesser demand for 400, 500, the market stales out. So if you own a big home here, you're, you're, the news to them is, hey, the market here could be much more affected than these other houses here. 
And now we know that the big market driver is supply and demand, and we know now demand is driven by rent versus buy. We can now, in Avanti way, come over here really quick and bring up the zip code information of the index of rent versus buy right in that market. So now, let's go ahead and scroll down here. Let's go to market data. Take a look at this incredible tool here, rent versus buy. Okay, I can quickly decipher here and say the zip codes that I'm looking at here are 33186, 331, 33172 is included in here. So now with my rent versus buy analyzer, I can quickly come over here and just ask it. Let this load. Ask it here, 33172. Okay, boom. What's the rent versus buy index? And it tells me right here very clearly, hey, it costs to own a house, to rent a house here, on average $1,500 a month, and it costs to own a house here $1,300. It's cheaper in that market to own than it is to rent. Big, big, big difference. Are we now seeing a storyline we can get out there and get to our clients? Now take a look at this. In my same business plan, I can click all the demographics of this neighborhood. Everything, how many people, how many people rent versus buy? How many, how many renters there are? What are the price ranges of renting in the market? Let me show you that data. That's very important for you guys to understand. You have your wages, you have the interest uh, in, the, in the market, the sourcings of earnings, um, travel time, education. You got every piece of information that you need to understand the demographics, who you're speaking to, should your content be in Spanish, should it be in English. So look at this, 51, 51% of the market rents there. 51, guys. And it's cheaper to own than it is to rent. This is a huge opportunity for you to develop that storyline. Use our Zoom tools that we are now launching to you for next week. You will have Zoom integrated into the Avanti Way platform. You can do a webinar of 100 people in a click of a button completely free to every Avanti Way agent that's here. And now you can, guys can start doing the first time home buyer seminar in this specific market, right? Are you guys getting me here? Thumbs up for those that are, are grabbing the story. Should we be sitting in our asses, excuse my language, and waiting for things to come up or let CNN tell everybody what needs to do or should it be us narrating that story? And that is the passion that I have for you guys out there. Push, be the narrator. These micro datas, let us speak specifically to our market and our side. Now, that being said, I can look at size of properties that are moving, right? Uh, what should be purchased? What are good ideas to purchase? And now we're breaking down absorption rates month by month, quarter by quarter, where the buyers are coming from. Are people using loans in this market to not? And look at the data. You see, remember in, uh, I told you in Miami, 33% were cash. 30% is cash here. 69% is finance here, right? Absorption rates of the markets, how things are moving in terms of units and volume and whatnot. And most importantly, guys, right here, you have 139 renters. This is 139 people, guys, that you can invite to a how to buy webinar on your side and how to save money monthly owning versus renting. That's 139 people that the next four months their rent is up. It's MLS data, it's rental communities, it's everything you need. You have here 335 people that somebody died in a household, somebody was born in a household, somebody bought a pregnancy test from CVS, Target, Walgreens, somebody, somebody uh, got divorced. You have all the data there with their emails and phone numbers. These are the people, guys. These are the people, guys, you need to reach out to and develop that micro data driven information to them. And you guys have it all here, literally all here in the fingertip. Uh, you got plenty of data from that national Miami side that I give you down to each one of your local markets. This is a very good market. In my opinion, this market's probably going to suffer less of a fluctuation of price ranges. Okay. And that being said, by you waiting to purchase a property in the long run, okay, because you think prices will come down and crash, and we know that 2008, which was the worst market ever 
because not even in the Great Depression did we see a correction of markets so deep. We got to 31%. So is it possible for us to go beyond 31%? Uh, anything's possible, but it's probably not probable. We know we'll be north, uh, south of that somewhere, right? So if you wait for a 15% market drop right now versus buying now, between what you'll spend to rent every month because it'll start increasing versus what you're gonna pay in your mortgage, you, the market in, in order for you to buy now would have to drop anywhere between 30 to 40% for, for it not to make sense for you. How do you do this? You might ask yourself, how did you just come up with that Enrique? And just grab our mortgage calculators over here. You have every calculator here and start running scenarios for yourself. Run the scenarios. Okay, if I buy this property right now at this price, what's the monthly cost? If it went down 10%, what would be the monthly cost? If it went down 20%, what would be 30, 40? I did this 50, 60 times. You just play with that calculator and you're going to see the trend that I just told you in, in your local market and be able to be that expert that is giving the, the information in solid form, real data, we don't want to manipulate data. We want real data. We want you to be real reporters, real information, and landing a logical position of why it's still today probably a good time for most people to buy. Not everybody, but probably the most people can buy. If they lost their job or they're about to lose their job, horrible time to buy. Do not buy. Do not push anything on that person because it's not worth it, right? We want to be the educators. We want to give the information there. Now let's go to the other extreme of the market because remember each market works different guys. Every single market in the micro level is so different. And that's why when we talk national and then we talk micro, there's such different conversations. And when we look at an area like Brickle, let's go ahead and get in here to Brickle. Okay. We just clicked, uh, I clicked the road, sorry. Let me reset my selection. Okay. I got Brickle, let's hit search. We are now going to see a completely, completely different area now. And this is the, the incredible part about micro data and the power you guys have for those of you that are in Avanti way and the power for those of you that are not that need to figure out how do you compile this information to bring it back into your market because the story is completely changed. Now let's take a look at a segment like this. Look at this complete buyer market, complete buyer market, complete opposite from the other side, not balanced, not seller, complete buyer market, 20,000 households in this little area that I picked. Okay, 695 properties closed. There's 1,700 properties available for sale in this market, guys. Very different numbers. Now you can see the average price per square foot. Now let's break this down. Let's get in here and take a look at what's going on. Okay, now you're seeing a lot of inventory for two bedrooms, very little sales. What is the minimum that they sell for the average, the maximum? Okay, the minimum, average, and maximum. We have all the contributions given here. So look at this, in two bedrooms, one in every two contracts, guys, one in every two contracts, the seller is giving money to the buyer to buy. That's very powerful data because they're trying to incentivize the market to move forward. And that being said, you have size of property, okay? The actual size is a property, how are they moving? And you're seeing dark blues everywhere. That means there's a lot more inventory than closed sales. This is obviously a buyer market, very different market that's going to react to this whole situation and a very different story line on what's going on. Now, again, by looking at some demographics, I got all my, my zip codes here, 33131. Let's get to the renter versus buy calculator really quick, 33131. Let's bring up that data. And now we're seeing it's more expensive to own than it is to rent in this market. You guys saw that? Boom, right there. So is the storyline here to convert renters into buyers? No. Is the storyline for investors to come in and buy? Unless they're buying very, very well and very cheap, right? They're getting good discounts, then it's probably worth buying in that market. And you'll probably see more of a reaction from sellers in this market in deeper discounts because you saw the discount on the other market, right? 
it was a it was like a four or five percent here on average it's seven but look at the discount by bedrooms you got seven you got you got 12 percent discount on four bedrooms look at that 14 percent discount on five bedrooms let's take a look at by size look at the different discounts you have you have 19 percent discount uh, sorry sorry six seven eight nine ten eleven percent discounts fifteen percent discounts a uh, 13 percent discounts on on 2,500 square feet and above. And let's take a look at, uh, at, at the lower markets. You see with more demand, 7% discount, 7 per, uh, 6%, 7%, 6% discount. You see the wide variety of discounting that starts happening by size, by bedrooms, and you could even see it by price ranges, okay? Let's look at price ranges. So discounts, okay, you're getting Obviously, the larger the price, 10% plus discounts, 12% plus discounts, and 900 a million and above, right? You, are, you guys are seeing the impact where those discounts are more prevalent in this market. So if I'm an investor and I'm hunting in this market, I'm looking for good deals, and I'm probably going to be receptive. Now, I won't be receptive. The sellers will be more receptive to negotiate with me a better deal in this particular market as opposed to that West Kendall market where there is a huge demand and the logic is very tightly put together in why somebody should move forward on that market. Is all this data making sense to you guys? Thumbs up on that? Thumbs up? Good? Good. I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to see that this is great information for you guys. So this is how you break down the story uh, to your side guys into your micro markets now i have all the knowledge i just went through this whole entire series that gave me many data points we will be sharing the presentations for you so if you guys have questions that you want me to specifically answer or want the presentation email me at enrique teran e-n-r-i-q-u-e Teran, T-E-R-A-N, at avantiway.com, Enrique Teran at avantiway.com. I'll be more than happy to share the slides with you, with any of you on your side, and even talk about some of the data points one-on-one, -on -one. whether you're with me at Avanti or you're outside the company, obviously, we'll be more than happy to kind of engage you and give you some ideas. But how do you bring this to life? You have the data points, you now have to get our social media badges. We have so many under agent services ready done for you. You can go into the COVID-19 material. You have certain icons already created for you, social media uh, icons that are all beautifully done here together for you. So you can click on very quick and you can edit them, change them around and get them out to your people with good data, good information. For all of you that are in Avanti, we already get the email templates, okay, of the datas of the month that can plug right into your market information and start putting your storyline out there. Facebook is a great method to get out there. Facebook stories. Um, there are also the LinkedIn stories for the professionals within your area where you could launch some great information. There's also the invitation and cold calling within your neighborhoods. We've gone over cold calling here. I've already heard four or five huge success stories from agents out there that are picking up the phone now. They're less scared. They're going out. And what are they doing? They are telling the story. They're narrating the story within their local market, giving people information, sharing. Right now, it's not about telling. The market prior to this, COVID-19, was all about telling. I just sold. I, wrote, I broke a record price. It was all about telling. I did this. I did that. It's no longer about that. Now the story is how you helped others achieve their goals, right? How you were able to help that family that the, the landlord was a jerk and, and wanted to throw them out. And as soon as this got over, you got them into a property, got them a good deal, and it was very quick to come together. Those are the important storylines, how you help the seller reach their goals in this havoc of a time. That is what people want to listen to. That is what you're going to connect with. And that is the big story you guys need to get out there. I'm going to open up the floor now for some questions uh, on our side to, to kind of go over and some information. And you have me to pick my brain. So anybody that has questions, please feel free to uh, come up and share 
experiences or information. I think I had Guillermo come back at some point. Yeah, I have him here. Let's see if he's still here. Hey, Guillermo, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hey, how's it going? So talk to us Great. about what you're feeling in the market and what's happening and kind of your reaction. Okay, well, uh, I do think it's kind of me like a U-shaped recovery, right? I, I uh, and got out of closing a like week before last week, so that closing did take a little more negotiation to get to the closing table. I've been getting some, some showings. I've been doing, I've been also doing in Facebook, I've been doing uh, the little markets, uh, little part of the markets, so I've been sharing data, so people have been asking me, so I've kind of become the person to go to certain questions, so I'm getting a lot more questions, right, uh, through my Facebook page, which I have a uh, Let's the pause game. right there, Guillermo. That that is a very big thing you just said. That is that is huge, because what started to happen is you become the authority in your market. You you yes. were able to grab these people, relay enough information where you built the authority. And you have to understand, and just to bring to light for the whole crowd, Guillermo's out there. He's picking up the phone. He's calling him and I spoke in touch base yesterday. He was telling me some of these tips. And what starts happening is all your competition or a lot of our competition in the industry is still hidden in their house. They don't realize that there's still a market happening and things happening. So right now, well, you're screaming for attention when nobody else is screaming. Well, okay. first of all, okay, I think it's very important for everybody to create their own, you know, have your personal page, have your, your business page separately from your page, right? And I'm getting through Facebook through, I kind of de developed a little system, which I kind of might want to share with people. Like I do a post in the morning on the Facebook stories. Stories are really big right now. Stories will migrate a lot more than they would normally do because Facebook, you know, they bought stories from Instagram. And yeah, and I let it sit there and I come back at night and then I see whoever made comments and I'm starting to see a lot of questions, right? The other thing that I had to do I love to door knock. I mean, my strong was the door knocking, and I kind of person that I kind of driven my business through door knocking a lot of it. And I can't door knock anymore. I was not very comfortable with the phone, so I had to like you know people were saying pivot, do this, do that, and, and you have to get out of your comfort zone. So I had to push myself completely to start call calling and go through the list that you guys are providing in this thing. And I started calling people up, and uh, you know. I'm, I don't want to say I'm good at it, but at least um, I kind of, you know, I'm getting feedback and I'm talking to people. I think that that 10 second pitch is very, very important. And I think that's one of the key things that I took away from that I was kind of missing that I need to fine tune that. And I think I'm that with a little 10 second pitch is kind of opening a lot of doors. So, yeah. so thanks for that, that training that you guys had. It was very good. I think I, I seen it like four times. I got over and over it. And, uh, but I definitely think picking up the phone right now, people are home, people are there willing to listen, people are bored. So if you have a good conversation, I mean, they're more willing to open up to you right now. They kind of want to hear your opinion. So right now, if you, you know, if you're not, if you're calling them and, and you kind of, people are dying to talk to you. So normally, you know, sometimes I call somebody and I'm kind of like, I'll be on the phone for like five minutes and I'm like, already want to hang up, you know? But I, so I do see the need right now, and there's there's a lot of lack of information, and people are asking. So uh, that's my story. I, but I do think it's going to be a, like a U shape. I do think people are are we're going to come out of us fast. But I think look, restaurants are going to open up at twenty five percent. I think it's going to all depend on how fast we open the economy, and if they open the economy, like like to say restaurants at a twenty five percent capacity. And right. uh, and then a fifty percent capacity. So I think those steps are also going to have an impact in how fast our economy recovers. Yeah, and, and to put in perspective what you just said, and I, I think you're referring to a V shape, which is more of a like touch bottom and, and go. But to bring in perspective what you're saying, Guillermo, un and that's what I was trying to say with the unemployment. And I would love to open up the floor for somebody to contemplate unemployment, their fears of unemployment, their concerns, because this is the time where we as a group can talk about these things. And, and pick each other's brain to see what they say. But if 25, like Guillermo said, 25% goes back, then 40% goes back, then 50, and we go slowly, but slowly, what does that mean? That one segment of unemployment that we saw, which is hospitality, will simply start diminishing those numbers and bringing people back to work, meaning more and more people will have economic power to consume and drive the economy back up. 
Guillermo, I'm so happy that training worked for you. That was the call training. You guys have it under the university, COVID-19. And for those of you that are outside the Avanti Way, learn.avantiway.com. We opened up our, our, uh, our, our platform of education with a lot of great materials to show out there. That video is there. That was groundbreaking. Uh, we took in light uh, um, uh, Belfort from the Wolf of Wall Street tactics, and I'm glad you're putting him to use, Guillermo. And I, to me, my only take is you broke out of the shell of just trying something, and now you feel you're good, and that, that, that high, if you will, is just going to make you repeat, repeat, repeat. And one of the ways to dominate the local market is great information, great storytelling. That's one, Guillermo, what you're doing. And then two is really building profound relationships. Because once they know you're the expert, what's happening to you is just a reflection that, hey, this guy's smart. He knows his stuff around here. I, 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 I have my aunt that lives here and wants to sell. Let me call him. And they're going to go to you continuously and your business will just catapult like a snowball. Great job, Guillermo. Anybody else want to share with us some ideas? Please raise your hand. Ines. Uh, go ahead and, and raise your hand on the on the uh, participant chat. There you go. Now I can unmute. Oh, I got Patricia. Hold on one second. I got Patricia, Gianfranco. Ines, go ahead and put your hand up and I'll bring you up. No, you don't find it? Okay. Here, let me, let me bring you up. Ines, here you go. Okay, Ines. You are unmuted, Ines. Oh, How are you? I feel like I'm in jail. I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to share a couple of things. Uh, number one, I love how you mentioned the fact that, you know, this is not a financial crisis. This is not a housing crisis. And it's really, really important for us as realtors to communicate that and tell our story at every which level possible. Um, yes, there will be a new normal, um, and, and you can see what we're doing in all of our offices in, in Avanti Way to make sure that we still, you know, have, don't have interruption of business, but the hyper local story is where it's at guys, because I, I, the media just puts everything in generalized terms. And at the end of the day, you know, they say, oh, Miami is doing poorly. And the reality is, you know, an area like Sunny Isles is going to behave completely different than the area in Kendall. And we saw the numbers right now comparing Brickle and Kendall. Um, so you do have a responsibility. And the fact that we have these tools is the reason I'm here with Avanti Way, period. Um, the fact that it would take me three to four hours to analyze data before, and now it takes me just seconds is really, really powerful stuff. Now, for those of you that are listening to this, um, you can still analyze data. It doesn't, <laughs> you, you can. Um, it's just gonna take you more work. That's the beauty of Enrique's brain and, and what he has created here. But the, the, there's a couple of, of other points that I wanted to make on the, on the storytelling. The renting versus buying, and I think it, it was trivialized sometimes, but it's just such an amazing tool to communicate to our sellers, buyers, and investors. It's, yeah. it's really important for them to know where that rent versus price scenario sits. And it's at a click of a button, just by looking at a zip code, you can tell that. Demographics is also super important for us to communicate. Now, I think our fear right now is the part of the lending aspect of it because we do have so many people that are claiming unemployment, then lending is becoming a little bit more difficult. It was difficult to begin with before this pandemic and now it's a little bit more difficult. So we have a responsibility as agents to protect our clients and their money while we're under a transaction and that's where education comes in. So I think it's, it's not only important to take a look at the data, but also educate ourselves in knowing how to protect our clients' money when they are getting financing in case they don't reach that closing table. So just listen, you're here watching the seminar, which means you're vested into your education and improving the industry and yourselves, which says a lot about how your business is and we commend you for being here. And obviously we're here to help you and be creative on, on how to get that story out. 
um, to your clients, to your customers. Great, great share. And I'll add two things you said there that I think are very important. Um, when you guys saw the mortgage um, availability index, um, that's a nationally public uh, index. Uh, it's very interesting. You could read on, on how it's formulated. And, and, and you saw back in, in 2008, it was at 900 and now it's at one, uh, 131, right? So it hasn't been too easy to get you know, financing. And you know, there could be variations on that. We've heard JP, uh, Chase uh, Bank say, look, we're only taking people with 700 scores and whatnot. So, so there obviously be a shift, but m most importantly, what all we're trying to do and what our storyline as realtors is we want to put people in houses that they can afford, right? We're not here to put people in houses that are going to create that wrong story and then they got kicked out. And then, you know, that's, that's the wrong story to create. I think we learned that in 2008. And I think storytelling, like Ines says, and something that I, I, I feel with her because before, you know, we're both data driven. She likes data as well. And I, you know, I have a lot of colleagues in the industry that love data, right? And before we, we, we were a lot more telling the data because it would take us so long to analyze one market. We were never really able to compare because the difference of, you know, the telling part of it, I, I would say you have different degrees, right? Ines, you have like simple telling and then you have really good storytellers, right? That, that memorize you and the story and you you get caught up into it and you're like, oh, wow, these are great points. And, and those people that say stories that are, that are very enlightening are the people that learn to compare, right? I think compare in our industry is such an important part in this. And, and it's really what we become experts in because people make decisions by comparing. And I can understand stories when you compare Kendall towards Brickell. I can compare, I can understand Coral Gables towards uh, Fontainebleau. Miami Shores towards this other market because you're giving me what's called perspective when you compare and your storyline becomes much, much more in depth. So agree to what Ines said, get out there, say the story. She's a social media goddess in our industry. I mean, you were, you were speaking on the National Association of Realtors not too long ago and you just did a, you just did a, a seminar for the board here locally for Spain and other countries. Now share a little bit of what what, what, what was the storytelling there that you did? Well, it's a, the story is that, like, for example, talking about open houses, um, Inman this morning, Brad Inman himself put a comment in, on Facebook saying that he's been talking to some smart realtors around the country saying how the open house will no longer be a popular thing. Um, and the, the conversation is really funny on the post because I come in and I say, I haven't been doing open houses for eight years eight years myself in my own business and i've been doing virtual open houses since so this is all the tools that we have now digitally to promote our businesses have been out there um some of us have been using them for a long time so that's the reason why nar not only at the local level i, I gave um actually how to do a virtual open house for my yeah. realtors last week um which i will repeat also in spanish um, I did one on, on, mark, on digital marketing for NAR and Español. I did one for um, Spain, for Emocionate, and another one for Sevilla. So they're inviting me all over the world to speak on digital marketing. And these are the tools we have here at Avanti Way, which we teach our, our agents on a daily basis, but we, we need to really empower them, you guys to understand that you know, this, this is the way of the future because number one, it keeps you safer. You pre-qualify your buyers and sellers in a much better and, and strict way. So you're not wasting your time and your client's time either. So it becomes just working smart. And, and it's the power of, of why we're here right now um, on a monitor, behind a monitor and using digital media. I love it. I love it. Working, working smart, not harder. That is, that is a big takeaway. And I, we love doing that here. Hey, I'm going to put up Patricia. Thank you so much, Ines. Patricia, um, you, whoa, wait, I just lost you. Give me a second. Hey, Patricia, here we go. Patricia, you are unmuted with me. Patricia, are you there? Yeah. Hi, Enrique. I'm here with Ivan. Uh, hi, Patricia and Ivan. Oh, Ivan is uh, the one that he has. If you don't mind, I'll be the one uh, making the statements. <laughs> I'll give you my perspective. Just as an FY, because they might be thinking out there, hey, shouldn't they be practicing social distancing? How are they? This is a husband and a wife, guys, so they're, they're okay. They're allowed to be together. 
<laughs> right. Uh, so um, my perspective, obviously, uh, as a real estate investor, but also as someone that's suffering some of the effects of the economy, I'll tell you something that I think I can, uh, we can all use to describe what's going on right now. We, throughout life, we may have a lot of injuries, and, but the, the scab that we pick at is the last one we have. So right. people will look at what happened during the last great recession and, and find the parallel and expect the market uh, house prices will come down because that's what happened last time. But the data you showed clearly states that the recession last time was caused by an oversupply and not enough demand. We we're just inflating prices. It, the problem was precisely the housing market. So that's not what we have here. It's a very balanced market. And in some areas is better than others. Overall in the US, uh, we're still at a very healthy level. So that, that's not going to be anything that we can concern, we should be concerned about. The economy, I think, will pick up when there is a cure or vaccine for this, unfortunately, because to say that people are going to be able to work at 25%, 50%, I mean, you look at the airlines, just to, to give you an example, and I know a little bit about this, we're American Airlines. I'd love to share with everybody. So the husband and wife, Patricia, works with us. Ivan invests with us. And Ivan's a pilot. So I, I would love to get your perspective of, of what the hell is going to happen to the airline industry, right? Well, I, I, I'll say this. when The last time when American Airlines restructured, I was part of the board of directors for the Allied Pilots Association. So I dealt directly with that whole issue. And, and, the, and the reason I'm mentioning this is, is because that time American Airlines was having a problem vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the market. Uh, we had a com competitive problem and we had to restructure. All the other airlines have restructured. In this case, no airline is able to make a profit at all. And they're actually looking at flying 10% uh, and maybe even 5% of what they were flying last year. Uh, the months where the airlines make money in the summer, that's all blown, it's out of here. Every airline is grounding uh, airplanes. And here we have a, another issue in a macroeconomic sense. Uh, most airlines and most business finance a lot of their heavy capital demands. Sure. And right now, if you were a bank or a lesser and you had you know, billions of dollars in debt in airplanes, what, what would you have to do? You, you're not going to take the airplanes back. You're going to have to renegotiate a better lease terms until things get better. So anyway, um, I, I think that uh, unfortunately for this area, this South Florida, since our industry is mostly services and uh, leisure, travel, that is critical that we get a cure or we get a vaccine because otherwise it's going to be hard, a lot of jobs lost. And right now, the airlines are being propped by the uh, government. Uh, as you know, they got over $50 billion in health, and that's going to pay for things until the September 30th. But all the airlines are saying after that, there's going to be massive furloughs and groundings of fleets, et cetera. So that will happen. Boeing is doing the same. You know, big corporations, big, big uh, payrolls. Um, the, the thing I want to say about, as you know, we have several investment properties. And, you know, with, if we know about the scab and we know that this is not that same situation that happened in the past, housing and rent is, a, is an, an essential need. So you would, you would stop spending money on many other things, but you're going to have to find shelter. And so uh, two things will happen. That, that's the last thing you'll need. And, and, and um, the government knows that, and they'll, that'll be the place where they'll mostly help. So you got the two, two of those things together. And as an investor, my concern was always, oh, my God, they're not going to pay me. The government's got some plans to pay me, uh, pay, have the tenants pay rent. But at the same time, think about this. If you're the tenant, do you really want to get eventually, even though you may be able to stay for the next two, three months in your house, be eventually evicted? How is that going to work out for your next housing? So tenants are doing whatever they can to try to make pay the rent. Um, the market is going sideways. And uh, so people that are very a lot more knowledgeable than any of us here about the market, like Warren Buffett, it's not even it took losses selling things. And he just uh, had the, the biggest stash of cash that he's ever had, okay? But the one thing he does say is, 
with the interest rates as low as they are, with, with the, with the uh, Fini May loans of 30 years at, at, at historic low rates, what you're doing in real estate is you're actually shorting the, shorting the dollar. Because, um, you know, as, as the, government, the, the, the government can only do, the Fed can only do what they, they're doing. They're printing right. more money, which meets, makes every one of those dollars be less valuable. So when you're buying a house for $100,000 and you put it on a 30-year loan and you're making these payments, whether it's, uh, it's making you $100 today, free cash flow, uh, 15 years down the road, the house may be worth $200,000. It's not because necessarily the housing, you know, the house went up in value, but the dollars you're paying, you need to find more dollars to buy the same asset because you know, the, the dollar value actually went down. So you, in, in a time. Depreciation of, of the value and then the inflation on the other side, right? So it, right. Yeah. right. So, so, you, so to lock in a long-term loan uh, as an investor for, you know, 30-year term at these historical low rates with the prospect of that dollar that you're, they're giving you today, borrowing the dollar today and paying it with a much devaluated dollar in years to come, that's how you're building a lot of wealth. And it's basically shorting the dollar. So that's the play, another play for investors. That is huge. No, no, and not only for investors, uh, you on in that side, it's, it's home ownership, sure. you know, addresses for a huge wealth sure. for, you know, the American people. So what you just said is, is a perfect storyline of, you know, not only investors taking advantage of that situation, which is great, but these homeowners that this is their investment the way you're positioning it, and I totally agree with that. It's almost like what what started happening for those of you that are in Venezuela, here in Miami, that live here, that that they were borrowing money, and then you know, two or six months or a year later, it, you would pay a hundred thousand for eight hundred thousand you borrowed. It was it was just crazy, you know, and and that that obviously tends to happen in real estate is the asset to do that. I put up Ivan on the on the screen and I shared it something that you were saying, which was bringing a little bit more to perspective. 2000, uh, 1999, it was a seller's market. We came all the way up to buyer's market and look where we are today, which put perspective, Ivan, in, in what you were saying. Ivan, a quick question for you. So airline industry right now is at a complete halt. Would we agree on that? Yes. We, we, we well, actually, uh, most airlines shut down their training centers. They stopped their hiring. They were hiring, uh, different airlines were hiring uh, close to 1,000 pilots each per year. That, that all was stopped. Now um, there are several fleets. And in the case of American, we, we grounded the 757, the 767, the E190, and now it was announced yesterday, the 330. Uh, so they're, they're grounding several fleets. Uh, I envision most airlines are gonna come out of this probably with a, a 10 to 20% schedule, maybe an operating 50% of the size of the fleet, with maybe another 20% of the fleet on a, on a, a long-term storage, which is, which is the kind of storage you can go in and you know, do some maintenance work and bring the airplanes back out if you needed to, right. not never, never land in the desert. So and these has are, American uh, Airlines forload the, the employees there? Like are no. you all of you and like, uh, you know, or, or most of you in, in forload or, or, or you're still getting paid, you're still employed? No, we, we, the CARES Act does not allow for that. And that's what I was saying earlier. The government understands be, when you shut down the airline, it's not just the people working at the airline with, with pretty decent salaries. It's all the industry associated with that, which in South Florida, I mean, Doral, you saw all the warehouses. What do you think those warehouses are there for? A lot of Yeah, so, so right now, the CARES Act does not allow any airline to furlough any employees until September 30th. So if someone wanted to renegotiate or, or um, get a new loan or whatever in the airline industry, probably now is the time to do it because I'm pretty sure that down the road, things might look a little different. But uh, yeah, 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 I would agree too. And, and you see 20% come up there in hospitality, in the hospitality market, as opposed to what you're seeing there. There was a lot of for for load, you know, a, a ton of it, and uh, and and you you kind of seeing like what Guillermo was saying, a recovery. Really, really good to hear from you, Ivan. I hope you guys are safe. I'm glad to hear your perspective. Very cool angle. Anybody else? And I'll put mute here. Take care, Ivan. Anybody else wants to share a story with us? Now is your chance. 
and we can talk perspect, prospect, uh, perspective on the market. Let me see if anybody else raised their hand. Yes, we have Gianfranco here. Gianfranco, talk to us. Yeah, one of the things that uh, during these days I've been seeing is that, uh, let's say like the $3,000 rents or higher, yes. those guys are readjusting into a lower budget for the rent. So we know that for us, the middle, middle low income area has been all, always the, the money maker. So for investors, it's funny, but I, I started talking about it. One of my clients, he called me and he was like, you were right. He told that prices were coming down. And, and, and he, he started explaining that he found something bigger for a lower price. And, and that's funny that at the end, on the niche that we know that there's going to be a high volume, we're going to get that, that high volume. And that's good for investors to understand that, that if they go to a right niche to put their money, they're going into a safer place and just buying something for, for buying something. Yeah. And the reality is that people right now, they don't care if they need to pay the cost, the exit cost of, of those properties because they, they do the math and at the end they're saving more money by doing the, the change yeah. than by staying, paying the, the, this, this high, high rent properties. I had a question for you that this was one of the things that yesterday doing some research, it came into my mind. Okay. Um, in some of these expensive areas that they live from the, the people that have bought properties here. And at mm -hmm. the end, we know that there's going to be some type of struggle or people will need to, to sell those really cheap in order to get the, the liquid cash. But is there maybe um, a, a problem that could be rising with the maintenance fees and everything for this big buildings again, considering yeah. what's going on? Yeah, because it's picture. I'm gonna bring up really quick on my screen. Uh, let's see if we still have it here. Um, a picture on the higher end perspective that I think is important for you to understand and, 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 and bring perspective to your question. Um, we'll quickly bring up Brickle here. Let's give this a quick second here. Okay. Yeah, because right um, now seeing that renters are going out and the economy on other countries, it's not so good. This might bring uh, some problems to, to the owners that they're struggling in their own countries at the end. Yeah, no, that we, we are, you're definitely going to get some shot, well, what I would call shotgun sales, which are like forced sales that you don't have a choice, but you have to sell. Um, and obviously you'll see some opportunities, but look at the, the light of what you're about to see from our data set on the micro level to answer your question. Um, it's very important you take this perspective, right? Um, let's give this a second here. It's compiling 20,000 records. Um, okay, here we go. So, so in that little area, just to answer your question and something you need to look at in the data, is we're gonna go into the types of closings here. And you're seeing here, as opposed to the national average was 30%, you're seeing 51% of the people paying cash, right? You have more people paying cash in that market than you do, um, than you do financing, right? And, and, and when too much financing is involved, Gianfranco, what happens is that you're more willing to, to uh, are you, give me a second, let me put my screen. Okay, you guys seeing it now? Brickle? Yep. Now, okay, yes, thank you. Uh, so you see types of closings, 51% have been cash. 48% have been conventional. Remember, national average is 30%. When we were looking at a market like uh, Kendall, there was 33% finance, uh, cash, the rest was it. Here you have a lot more cash. And in fact, if you go back two or three years, uh, it, was, it was 60, 70, 80% cash, right? Predominantly cash. So Gianfranco, what tends to happen in this market is you will have a couple of sellers that need liquidity, like you said, they will probably give up a good deal, but overall, because there's so much cash in that market, the, the seller has power to hold, right? I'll refinance the property or I'll get, a, I'll get a, a, an interest rate of 12%. I don't even care. I'll get a big loan a, at a high interest rate just to cover my monthly you know, things so kind of things pan out. And that helps create somewhat of a stability within the markets. Nonetheless, markets like this where there's high inventory, 
that 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 whole thing is going to have to chain off and kind of adjust itself. And it does position you in markets like this to try to attempt to get good deals for the people that need liquidity that were not expecting this storm to come in. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, because it was something that popped up in my head just seeing the shift how it was going. But yeah, yeah, this is uh, clear that they can get a refinance and get some cash in order to to go for the long run. Yeah, yeah. that's the way you would yeah. get out of that. All righty, right. guys. Uh, thank you, Gianfranco. I'm going to put Andres Corda, who raised his hand. Let's see what my partner has to say. <laughs> Hi, Don, guys. Andres, are you live? I'm live. Hopefully. I don't know. Do you guys see me? Be careful that I have the mute button, eh? <laughs> now I have now, now I have the video. No, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <laughs> speak for much. I just wanna I just wanna first of all thank you, Enrique, for all the insights and I uh, hope all of you guys really took a lot of notes and advantage of what what Enrique displayed this morning, uh, because I, all I wanna give you guys as a as my comment today is that these days there is nothing more important than becoming a resource to your audiences and your people. And this is having data and being that person that can explain data in chunks and in bites that they can understand. It's one of the most thought after things in a moment like today. So you are one of the most or could become one of the most relevant consultants, advisors at this time and shift in the market. So this is the time to step up, understand what are the, and you can start small and grow from there on the amount of data and things that you are putting out there. But this is where you have to shine. You have the tools, the resources, the, the, the way to dissect data with all of our tools and advice. On, so find what are the things that you need to know about your micro market following the specifics that Enrique outlined today, whether it's inventory, price, price versus, versus rent ratios, um, the, the absorption rates, the, the number of sales, number of actives, the rent versus buy, and be able to dissect that into your particular audience needs and decisions are made with data once you have the data you can understand uh, what, what what are the the pros the cons uh, what happens if i move this way that way and, and people are just lost out there and are just reading and hearing the news that don't give them that specific and even if somebody else in the news uh, or in big big talks is giving data they're giving macro data even today from what Enrique spoke to you guys, you can't grab this exact presentation and then put it to your people because it might not be exactly what's happening in your neck of the woods. So it's just, I wanna invite all of you to really step up your game now and understand the matrix that Enrique outlined today is what you need to get out of this so that you can apply it in your specific markets, segments, uh, necessities, and be that resource. And then how do you put it out? Whether it's by an email blog, whether it's by a website, whether it is by social media or by Zoom meetings, coffee with me every, every Friday, I give you the snaps of the market, what's, what came out, what came in and all those things and what platforms you use to get out, you choose depending on what's best, but people, you will have more attention from people now that you've ever had. And as Ivan was saying before, this is the necessity. You have a, you are working in a business and in a line of, of business where people need you this time more than ever, because these are the most important decisions that they're making right now, given the, the situation. So I invite you all to really use this as a, as a foundation and then take it to your micro market well. And if you need anything or have any questions, on how to do that, please definitely reach out to us so we can help you guide you further, no? But yeah, you know, I, I, I do, that's a very important takeaway. And, and the power of the data, because I think he brings a good point, is, is we, we, all, we all, when we're out there speaking or out there marketing, what we're trying to do is find common ground, right? When we do an advertisement ad that, that I can relate to, I found common ground and it grabs my attention. When I'm conversing with somebody, I'm trying to find common grounds to speak at. Right, and, and I think the national data perspective I gave you is the common ground you're gonna find 
to communicate to your clients. So like Andres said, you, you can't copy that and say this is what's going on in your local market because it would be wrong. But by knowing this information on top, I just found a common ground that I probably know you and I will talk to. And how that top data relates now to the micro, it's the expert. It's the shepherd, if you will, that's bringing the sheep into where they need to go to. And then you become the narrator, the person in control of that communication, which is huge, guys. And that is a big, big tip uh, Andres gave there. Andres, I'm going to keep you here because there's a couple questions that I love to see your angles and, and, and give them to the crowd. We had one person, Roberto Carrillo, who said, hey, we need a less optimistic look. If banks refinance properties for their owners to recover lost money, how they paid the high cost of their mortgages, how did homeowners who rent their properties without receiving their rent survive? without a job and how rent, uh, how to rent a house, without a job, how to move the market for buying and selling real estate. And, and this is a good question. I'll give my perspective. You can give yours. Uh, Robert, I, I mean, listen, even if 20% of the market gets unemployed, 80% has a job, right? Uh, even if 50% get employed, 50% have a job, you know? So, so you have to look at, the other side of the market and where as if you're a real estate professional, you're looking for that move. If you're an investor, you might be looking for the other move of where is there opportunities for you to take advantage of. Now, rent, if you invested in the right realm and you were led by a realtor who understands the information, would have sold you a good investment that today, you know, people are paying you rent. If you're within the markets of a thousand to three thousand dollars, they've been very, very lightly affected by this situation on, on a global level. Yes, there's been effects there. People lost their jobs, they can't pay. But nonetheless, if, if it gets very ugly, Robert, the government will give what's called Section 8, which exists nowadays, and will be paying vouchers for people like they have in the past and like they do today. There's people that can't afford or don't have a, a, the capacity to get a job and the government apply or you apply for Section 8 and you get it. Andres, you want to give him your perspective on that one? Yeah, it, 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 it's a similar one. I mean, at the end of the day, you have an undersupply uh, in most places in the, in the United States. So, so it's not in the developers now are not building a, a more right now. So, so you have uh, uh, just a shift of people that go from one place to the other. There's some people that definitely are going to get out of their homes, but most of their homes have equity. So it's not going to force them to a foreclosure situation. They just have to sell for a discount if they have to uh, reduce and go somewhere else. And there are enough people in the market that will have then the money with the financing that's being offered and the people that are kept with the job that at a slight reduce, reduction of price or at an X amount of reduction of price, which is not going to crash the, the, the market and the equation, will come into those properties and then they'll, they'll be going into a, into a, into a rental, into a rental situation. So there, it's a, just a shift of uh, people coming from one type of properties to the other uh, with the low interest rates that we have. And, and obviously the people that will, will keep employed, this is all going to depend on how fast, uh, you know, we, we can reopen and how many people then also come back and, and, and get their jobs back. Obviously, the, we, we, it's going to take a while for everything to get back to normal. But in our line of business, there's going to be so much business or type of transaction. Remember, we're in the transactional side. So you always have to put uh, your, 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 uh, your advice into whatever situation you can help your consumer at. But there's always going to be something to help them with. And there's a, and there's a commission <laughs> attached to, to, to that if, if you're able to guide them into whatever transaction they're going, they're going to do. So transactions are going, as, as you get back to the normal, are going to come back up. The, the price fluctuations will, will vary depending on each market. And that's where the micro data is okay. going to help you determine if in that particular market, it's going to shift more to the rents or to the, or to the buys. And that's why having the data in the micro element is going to be more relevant than the macro that, that can paint a different picture. And, and, and I think to add to what Robert says um, in his outlook is, yes, some markets, because it sounds, it sounds like you're watching a lot of the macro news based on your question, yeah. right? And, and it's okay because that's most of the information we get out there. And, and the macro, like Andres said, in some of these micro pockets of neighborhoods, you know, the macro of unemployment will be huge. It could be yeah. devastating in those areas. But again, 
20% unemployment means 80% of the people are still working. 30% unemployment means 70% of the people. There's still a market that you can identify and be able to transact, and that's always going to be there for necessity in terms of the impact. And that's the important one to find. I got a question here, Andres, that I'm going to take a stab at, uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, Antonio uh, Omedas asked, he knows how to do the reports for micro on zip code subdivisions, but he would love to do it within um, within a within a price range, right? And in a, a in the system, I'll go back here. I'm going to share my screen. Oh yeah, of course. You got to filter. If you filter it, you can filter yes. the price range. So if we go back here, let me share my screen. Where did my uh, okay share start share. Share screens. Okay. So if you come over here on the market report, right? Um, you can customize your, your area. Give me a second here. You can customize your area, area, Antonio, in terms of what you're looking for. And let, let, let's just hypothetically say I have here, I have, oh, I, I pressed it too early. Over here, you have filters. And the filters can help me narrow down within price ranges, within structure, so I can see a lot more of the demand, if you will, for the area. And you can, you know, you but, can do larger segments to understand the impact of the data. Yeah. Um, I'll go back here, just erase this really quick. What you have to do is do the filter first and then pick your area. So here you're getting uh, the information that you would, uh, you would need on your side. And I'll have them add for you the price range you just asked me for. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the, for, for the price range, you'll have to do it on the last on the last step now on the business plan. In the last one, you can you can change the price. So go 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 to the do a regular one, and if you go to the last piece, you'll okay. have the, the business plan piece. I got you. Let's walk them through, Antonio. So you have that answered for you. Meanwhile, this is going. Uh, we have another question here uh, again from Robert. No. And he asked here another good question. We have the different crisis from the one that occurred in 2008 to 2010. Uh, at this moment, nobody lost. Uh, at this moment, nobody lost their job. People lost their credit uh, for using virtual credit and, and the fault of the financial system. Now the crisis is totally different. People have no jobs and do not receive money. How to how to pay bills and refinance or buy or invest? This is world terms. Only the Chinese had the money at the end of the crisis. Again, I, I, Robert, it, it seems like a lot of news, a lot of global news, bring it down to the micro. Every market is affected uh, in different ways. Uh, and again, I, I, the rule of, of thumb, 70, 30, 20, 80, there's still a market that's buying. There's still a market that's consuming. The world did not end, you know, uh, uh, by this. Andres, I'll quickly do what you just said. So you click here, you go to next when you bring it up. And then I can do a custom range within price ranges. Yeah. Uh, let's say 100 to, to um, uh, 250, right? And I hit calculate yeah. and then all the data now, Antonio, changes specifically for that uh, market that you're in on that side. I hope that helped on your side, Antonio. Uh, just digging in through any other questions here. Um, is that the months of inventory for Florida, South Florida, or national? Eduardo, we went through national, and then we went through uh, South Florida uh, in comparison, and then we broke down into the micro levels uh, on that. Uh, we got another question. Do you expect market prices to drop? If so, how much average? My opinion, certain markets, you'll see different types of drops because there's not enough supply to meet the demand before we got into there it's going to help kind of uh, uh, protect certain parts of that uh, deviation. I'm still not expecting to see a huge drop unless unemployment, you know, starts hitting 40 or 35% where you could see some of that. Andres, what's your take on that one? Listen, again, it varies market by market. I, I would definitely look into in, in, in type of property to type of property. So I would definitely would, would want to look at the specific markets that you are servicing. And, and, and that's why the hacking the data part is so important. On a macro level, if, if you want to get my take on it, uh, there are certain markets uh, where, where there's not this necessity the market where you see a lot of uh, the second home ownership market or high-end investment market. That, that might have a, 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 
uh, a hit, uh, but I, I don't expect it to be that much of a that big of a hit because you have the people that would come in and purchase in those markets before it goes lower. Because because again, it's a transfer of funds from from the people that have the ability to come into strong markets. But you 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 will see most likely a shock at the beginning where people need 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 liquidity. They can't get refi for one way or another, and they're going to have to unload their properties because of a cash flow necessity in a particular situation. A lot of people that were over leveraged or, or had their money invested in different places and don't have income anymore. Uh, so in those specific places, you will find uh, deals and, and, and um, you, you, you just have to scout them and you have to be the one trying, if you're, uh, if you're helping buyers in those sections, if somebody had the necessity to sell before and they don't have a cash flow situation where they can wait, you will have uh, a certain certain amount of properties that will will definitely have a reduction in price, but that's a very short term, in my opinion, scenario that you'll see, yeah. and especially you'll see it on the higher end part. The lower end uh, uh, situations uh, are, are a bit different. Uh, you, you remember, you're getting right now the forbearance for most of these homes, so the people that have mortgages won't run to sell their home unless they were already planning on selling and they had the necessity and there's an urgency to sell. Uh, because they're, they're going to take the forbearance and they're going to see how the market adapts. So it's all going to depend how extended this crisis goes as far as the unemployment and all of that. If that really peaks to a higher level, because we're in, we might be in the middle of the storm yet, uh, the, the, the story is going to be different. But assuming that's not the case and we can level it off at a 30% unemployment, you'll still, I, I feel, don't have that level of of, of, of drop, although there will be in, in many markets, very good deals. So you have to be the one looking for them for your clients. Now, same happens in rents. Uh, the, the track is, and as Enrique was saying before, uh, recessions bring higher rents. But in the very, very short term, you will see a drop on rents. And you might say, what do you mean? I'm seeing drops of rents. And that's short term. That's the shop. A lot of landlords uh, are, are renegotiating with their tenants uh for them to stay and the, the tenants were supposed to leave and they're trying to keep them in the property so they're they're they're, they're, they're trying to fix vacancy and the ones that had it empty right now are going to have like a promotion uh, rent coming in but it's a short-term situation as the recession or a shift of the market in the economy changes obviously when people can't buy uh, or have access to, to credit that much, they're going to shift more to rents and the rents with the same type of inventory are going to increase. So short term versus middle term, long term is going to be a different outlook and by market as well. But those are my general thoughts on the on the uh, overall picture. That's a great perspective. And I think in the investment arena as well. Now I'm going to share with you guys really quick my screen again and bring a little bit perspective of light of, of the market and, and rate. So he, here you have uh, interest rates at 2.75 all the way to 4.25. Okay, the cost of owning a three hundred thousand dollar home for mortgage P and I. Okay, uh, at two point seven five, it would be one thousand two hundred twenty five. At four point two five, one thousand four hundred seventy eight. Now we see a discount in the market, right? How much would we save, right? If if this happened, right? And what's the break even point in terms of the rate to more or less stay within the same range? And something that's very interesting, Andres, in perspective to a, an emotional buyer buying their home right now, if the market tweaks 10%, like you see here, the difference of their mortgage would be less than $100 a month. Yeah. Think about that. So even if we had a 20% drop, just to bring this into perspective, Andres, 20%, okay? The mortgage difference per month would be less than $200. Yeah. Now you do a 30% drop, it would be less than $300. These are not make it or break it numbers for somebody to sit on the sideline and wait, because if you wait, interest rates can go up, loans can become more difficult, and you lose. And rentals and rentals will Why increase. Save hundred dollars a month. Does that make sense? And, to you? Uh, uh, yeah, and the rentals will increase on the rate too. So right now, uh, you might see, oh my God, they're giving me a deal on a rental, and it's going to be short lived. So when rentals are going to come up, right now you can really secure a thirty a thirty year fix, and and you don't have to wait until the market is the lowest. So the key is that the people that can get financing are going to have a really good upper hand right now. And those are the guys that will move. And lock it in. I agree. There is one more great question here from uh, Sandra. She asked, does the, the, the uh, cost to own 
a relationship we have include HOA taxes and utility? The answer is yes, it includes everything uh, on that side. And then she asked, uh, could you add a key summary to features where it says the data range, last 12 months through 2000, uh, so I can tell my clients, if you want, guys, if you email me, I'll send you over the presentation for you guys. Obviously, in Avanti Way, we'll soon be receiving the physical presentation on your side. Uh, grab snapshots compared to your market and get it out there. We've achieved the two hours on this. Guys, it's been super, super exciting to share with you. I hope I brought great perspective to you. I love the Realtor Star thing. We're passionate about giving back information. And for us here at Avanti Way, let's continue to be the leaders in the industry, the leaders in bringing the right information to consumers and leading us out of this pandemic. Yeah. We love you all. Hope you all are safe. Bye-bye.